before we we get going and you tell us uh, what we're going to talk about, Mark, um, if anyone does use aims and objectives in their lessons currently and talk to their students about them, maybe pop in the chat box uh, what you do and, and how you do it, and we can refer back to that as we go. Um, but Mark, tell us about ourselves. So, hi, my name is Mark, and um, along with David, we kind of started a, a blog in 2014 called Textploitation. And the idea was really born out of the idea that we didn't see texts being used as much as we thought they could be. We saw text being lots of great texts being taken into classrooms when we observed, but very often it would be done for a single activity. So either as, as perhaps an, an exercise to raise awareness of, of a particular language point or to practice a particular skill and then the next part of the lesson would very often engage involve a new fresh different material um or you know gap fill activity from a, a decontextualized source and this jarred with us and our kind of beliefs on how um language teaching could and perhaps should be and so we started working on lessons together um we both fairly recently finished Deltas, which is a long time ago now. Um, and we, we looked for ways that we could build entire lessons around one text. And we started writing um, some of these up in, in a blog form and talking about it at conferences and eventually um, at the worst time imaginable in the pandemic, we released our first book, uh, the second or third week of lockdown in the UK as no one in the world was really interested in anything that wasn't online materials. Um, but Textploitation was born out of, out of the blog. And there's a, the, the blog is still there. It's got a, a hundred or more lessons that you can access freely. And there's also the book. But alongside this, we noticed that our teaching was perhaps not only about the text, but about some of the conversations that we felt were important to have with students to bring them along with us on the journey. And some of this was informed by people like Hattie. Um, and other was that really born out of our own experience of teaching in class and, and challenging and questioning ourselves. And this strand kind of is embedded into all of the lessons, but we also felt it kind of deserved its own place. And this is what we call overt teaching. And we're gonna hopefully make the case for a, a kind of an overt approach today, because what we're gonna do is establish what we believe as overt teachers. Um, we're gonna explore our approach to writing aims and objectives, and we're hopefully gonna challenge some of the existing way in which aims and objectives are seen and, and maybe move them from being a bit of a tick box to actually a useful embedded part of, of a learning experience. And we're going to share some ideas for, for getting learners into the learning discussion. And you'll see this format frequently today, that today we are going to, so that you can, um, help your students to discuss their learning. And we're going to hopefully make a convincing argument for why your students should be discussing their learning. Sure. And greetings to everyone that's coming in as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we often think about kind of reverse engineering this in in order for all of these things to to kind of to be put in place and to build the structure we need to know what we want and, and what we feel we want as teachers is students who know what they're learning they're they're active participants in this they're not just receivers of information they are helping us along the journey and in fact they are making the journey we are facilitating that um, we are not the drivers of this or the sole drivers of this. We want them to know why they're learning it. And that's not, we're learning this because it's in the course book. That's where is the, the place that you can use this outside of the classroom? What will this bit of language enable you to do in a functional sense? Uh, it's one of the things that I find frequently in class is a, a language point like conditionals, and I love conditionals, but asking students, where do we use conditionals? And students are really good at giving me the form and really bad at thinking about where we might use them. And if they don't know where to use them, why will they use them? For some languages, that's easier because they're similar in, in some languages, but in others, they don't work in the same way. And so 
we need to ally this this sense of why and not just the function of it but the context that goes all around that we also want students who can choose their own levels of success and david's going to talk about this in quite a bit of detail later but by this we mean that they know when they're making progress and i think particularly b1 upwards there's there's long been this feeling and i'm sure some of you have had this with students who feel they're making no progress because when they're in beginner level they learned five new words and it almost doubled their vocabulary or one day they didn't have the past tense and now they can and now they live in multiple time zones and time time existences whereas before they were trapped in the present um and really all of this is, is this idea that we want students who can engage in the discussion of feedback and learning. And this maybe makes some of those tutorials that we might have with students more meaningful because we can give them better guidance. And this is ultimately our holy grail. Um, this is what we're aiming for when we're trying to create this type of atmosphere in an overt classroom. We want students who can do all of these things. It's a big ask, but we don't think it's impossible. And we've been able to do it with our own classes. And it all starts for us with uh, clear aims and objectives. So today we're going to use an example lesson. Uh, this is just a lesson on telling anecdotes. Uh, so I'm going to roll out the aims and objectives for what this lesson would be. So today the students are going to revise tenses for telling stories, learn to give background information using past perfect, learn to use story signposting to engage the listeners, learn to stress and pause after a signpost to engage our listener, learn to show interest when listening, also that they can tell and follow an engaging anecdote. You don't need to, to see the lesson material really, and um, we're just sort of focusing on our aims and objectives. So we're gonna dig into this and, and really look at how we write them and why we write them that way. So this is our example, let's highlight some points. The first thing for us is a clear pattern. We want to remove any obstacles because we want our learners to not just be told what's happening in the lesson. We want them to engage with it. We want them to be able to talk about it. And if you're writing your aims and objectives in, in different ways, every time the student comes in, they've got to reorientate themselves, figure it out, find the objective, find the aims. So what we want is a clear pattern. This is our favorite pattern. Today we're going to so that you can because it works across sort of all levels, all age groups. It's easy. It's, you know, aim, 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 real life objective. Um, it's not the only one in the book. We explore other ways of doing it. it. The way you write it isn't necessarily the most important. It's that it has a clear pattern that you are consistent with. Now, if you're consistent across all of your lessons, this is good. Students know they can come in, they can see it, they understand it. Um, but if you can be consistent across your school, even better. Uh, a lot of research shows that when you have this uh, across the whole school, the impact is greater uh, because students are seeing it everywhere and building these learning skills that are so important. So that's our first part. Follow a clear pattern for us. Today, we're going to so that you can. The next thing is you have to have a real life objective. Right? So tell and follow an engaging anecdote. We want our learners to be able to see how they can immediately use this outside the classroom. And the objective can't be uh, grammar based or, or language based. It has to be something they will actually do. So you couldn't write or you shouldn't write uh, tell a story using narrative tenses. No, because that's grammar based. That's not a, a real life objective. We want them thinking about what they will actually do outside the classroom and telling an anecdote. And, and, engaging and let's anecdotes. think about, let's kind of unpick that. So there's nothing wrong with focusing on narrative tenses. They're brilliant. But why do we use more than one tense? We could tell a story in only past simple. Why do we dip into past continuous? What's its function? Well, very often it provides the opening sentence or some sense of background to the story. It's not the main action, but it's something that is happening that is interrupted. You know, I was walking down the street when I saw. The when I saw is the important bit, but the past continuous I was walking down the street gives us this, this background feeling. Why do we use past perfect? What's its function? So to make a story more interesting, 
the blend of tenses makes it a gripping story. If, if you ever, I have younger siblings and when I was young, they would tell me stories and their stories were rubbish, universally rubbish stories because they only existed. I did this, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this, then I did this. It's not interesting to listen to. And so it's about telling an engaging anecdote, not merely ticking some grammar box. And it's, it's when, when you're writing this real life objective, the idea is obviously like um, Mark said, it's something real that could see in this case, an engaging anecdote, uh, but also that your whole lesson is moving in this direction. Your, your students can see they will achieve this by the end uh, in some measure. Um, what we also like to do it again, because we're not here just to tell our students what they're going to learn or what's going to happen in the lesson. We want them to be able to discuss it. So in the verbs we choose, we will uh, make sure that we highlight if something is new, as in you're going to learn this, or if something is revision, as in maybe revised tenses for telling stories. Because if learners come in and see, for example, oh, present perfect, again, I've been studying this since I was five years old, I'm now 95, this is terrible. It, it's that disengagement. So we want to make sure, that, let them know that we have acknowledged that, that we are saying this is the key learnings and this is revision or this is discussion or this is examining. So we make sure that we choose verbs um, and then they're at the very beginning of every bullet point so that students, uh, we're sending clear messages to our learners. And as Mark said, um, we make sure to focus on function. So we're not uh, going to just learn the past perfect, we're going to learn to give background information using the past perfect. So students are aware they are learning grammar, they are focusing on it, but uh, our focus is on the function. Again, why? Because we want them to be able to talk about it. We want them to see, oh, maybe you are doing the present perfect for the 95th time, but you're focusing on this function of it and you're going to revise it or learn it, whatever it is. Maybe it's a new function, maybe you're adding it in. Um, David, I've just got a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. We've used a word here, um, signposting. Mm. What do we mean by that? Good question, Mark. So um, when you were talking about your terrible siblings telling, not your terrible siblings, your siblings telling terrible <laughs> stories. Um, very often in a kid's story, it would be, and then, and then, and then, and then. And this sort of, and then is a signpost because it tells the listener what is uh, sort of information is coming next. So it could be suddenly, however, on the other hand, um, and so in this uh, in this lesson, we're looking at uh, signposting to engage our listeners and help them to follow uh, the story. Absolutely. And I have to say, I love the use of the term signpost as opposed to um, discourse markers or linking words. Link, linking words, because really, when we look at academic writing, particularly linking words don't link. Mm -hmm. they, they direct the reader to what's coming next. So I really prefer and, and try to encourage students to think about these as signposts because again it moves it away from pure meaning to function mm. and I think that's really important and that's probably going to be a recurring theme in today's talk this idea of function driving the way we think about language and the, and the way we have discussions with students yes and so right so now we have it we have our aims and objectives and I think for for, for a lot of us, I mean, I know I was I was guilty of this in the past. Maybe I had good aims and objectives, but I would just sort of pop them on the board and leave them be. Or I might pop them on the board and tell my students and then dive off into my super engaging lesson. Um, or I might just uh, tell them and not put them on the board. And I think we've always, in our industry, there's a lot of, um, a lot of tick boxes that we do in the classroom. It's like, oh, we know that we should have aims and objectives. Maybe our accreditation bodies or our, our managers have told us we have to have them. British Council. British Council have told us we have to have them. But in general, those things are driven the, like, by positive means and positive reasons. Um, and so we really want to make the case for uh, taking this. Maybe you do it somewhat, taking it from that tick box and moving it into a talking point. Because once you have set them up like this, you can be in a beautiful, beautiful conversation. At the very beginning of our lesson, we enter into dialogues with our students about the aims and objectives. It begins with a question uh, like this, focusing on the objective. How will this help you in your real life? 
because maybe a student I've, I've had this where a student says I don't tell anecdotes and then you say what did you do last night and do you ever talk about that with your friends do you ever talk about when you went to a, a party or an event or a museum or do you um, ever talk about transport disasters or a holiday you went on and they say yes 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 all those things yes 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 so okay then you tell anecdotes don't worry so at the very beginning of the lesson you're helping learners to really see the relevance of the lesson now if a learner is looking at your aims and objectives and feeling like it's not relevant for them but not telling you you've got disengagement from the very beginning of the lesson yeah, opening up though to it's going to go up exactly and so this question just really opens up um opens up that conversation so you are more informed and they are more informed and everyone sees the relevance it also allows you then to sort of hop back to that at different points in the lesson where maybe when you're moving towards the uh, anecdote or when you're looking at the lexus in the lesson the vocabulary maybe you there's a student who has identified that they like to tell transport disaster anecdotes you're like okay these ones are going to be good for you whereas you like to tell holiday stories okay these this will be good for you so it gives you more information at the very beginning that's the objective but there's all these beautiful aims now what we want to do is we want everyone moving towards this objective but it would be mad for us to think that everyone's going to achieve it in the same way uh, our, our learners all come with different backgrounds in English language learning, um, different strengths and weaknesses, different interests. Um, I knew a student once who could tell you all the names for very weird weapons because he'd learned English on like World of Warcraft, but no words for like food or anything. We've all got these you know, axes and maces and everything. Um, we've all got these this different interests and, and different backgrounds. So we can't assume that everyone is going to approach these aims in the same way or feel the same way about them. We want to start that at the beginning of the class. Which of this, these are you confident in already and which will be challenging for you? Because once we open up that, we get a student who we, we've identified students who we can come to because they might be experts in this area they're the stronger ones in the class we can use them as models we can pair them up with someone who might be a bit weaker in this area and we can still uh, even in an activity the student might feel they're confident in we can make use of them for the others and they still feel that they're getting a lot out of it as well we have identified which areas are challenging for different students in our class so we can make sure that at those points we're refocusing them we're reminding them remember you mentioned this was difficult I really need you in the zone right now um, because again it's madness to think that uh, across a whole lesson all of our students are focusing their attention at exactly the same time uh, and exactly the same level so it will ebb and flow because we know which bits are, are going to be tricky for them we can bring them in at those appropriate times um, and that's how this, this uh, conversation starts at the beginning of the lesson but it weaves its way throughout. You said this will be challenging. How was it? Are you okay with it? Do you need a little bit more support? Uh, this is a good point for you to help your partner here. You said you were quite confident in this. Uh, this part, really focus on this part for you. We are weaving this thread throughout our entire lesson, but it all begins with these aims and objectives consistently written and uh, removing all the obstacles to students discussing them. So, Mark. We want students who, how are we doing with this? Let's let's take some. Well, let's have a look. Let's see where we're up to. So hopefully we've got students who know what they're learning and have some insight into to why they're learning it. But as David's just alluded to that, well, no, he didn't allude, he stated it. Um, students have spiky profiles. And what is going to be a success for one student who knows this is a real area of weakness for them should not be the same for the student who feels this is an area they're really confident at so allowing for differential between what is viewed as success by the students themselves is crucial because that way all students are being pushed and not pushed to a point that they're not comfortable going where they're going to be demotivated by failing to live up to a criteria that realistically they were never going to match anyway remember when we're in class we're not testing things <clears throat> against a static framework this is not an exam 
we're supposed to be developing learning. So these should be formative tasks that help them eventually get to a certain point. And so allowing them sort of autonomy um, and control over their own version of what is success is really important. And that's what we're going to come to next and engaging them in that discussion. Because again, as David said, if they can't see the point, if we haven't made the point for this, they're not going to engage and we need them with us on that journey. Yeah. We're closer to our holy grail. Valerie. It's nice. Isn't it? um, yeah, we're closer to our holy grail. We're not quite there. No, uh, we've got a little. Quite. We've got a little task for these guys, though, don't we, Mark? We do. We absolutely do. So, what I would love for you to do, if you can, we're not going to give you long for this, um, is what would the success criteria for an engaging anecdote be? And Mark, do you want to just explain what you mean by success criteria while yeah. people are writing? So here, what I mean is. If you were trying to give your students things to work on when they're in their class and you're going to say, so in order to tell a successful anecdote, what needs to be there? What little things could we say? Yep, you did that. Yep, you did that. Yep, you did that. What would make it work? OK, how would we gauge how would we measure success? So for this specific lesson, telling and following an engaging anecdote, could anyone give us in the chat window an example of what some success criteria might be? Let's see what you can do. And then we'll show you ours, don't worry. Ah, Andy. Yeah, but can you write them as sentences, Andy? But it is a very good point. And it's it, the, the whole idea here, Mark, is, um, is as what Hattie and Zira said, John Hattie, check out John Hattie. He's absolutely fantastic. Um, but There's great short videos said, available as well. On YouTube. But they said in their in their book uh, on visible learning, uh, success criteria and learning objectives are two sides of the same coin. And I think this is hugely important. Uh, so Andy is right. He is. Uh, we've got a lovely point here from Clem, perhaps trying and expressing ideas using stretches of language. So this idea of a slightly more lexical way of thinking about language. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. But could we hone that and, and narrow it down a little bit more? Using a range of narrative tenses. Yes, but why, Fiona? Why the range? Why do we want this range? I like Andy's. Uh, uh, there's always, like, we, we talk a lot before, like, not so much today, but in other talks about uh, experiential criteria. So, like, are your, where are your students able to follow it? Where are they engaged by it? Did they enjoy it? And again, yeah, these can be real measures of success. It doesn't all have to be linguistic criteria. And obviously, right. yeah. Are your classmates enjoying it? That's massively subjective. But I think almost all of us can say, well, it was not that interesting. <laughs> to make a story come to life, to engage listeners in the anecdote. Yes, to be humorous. Absolutely. Good anecdotes are very often funny. And yeah, I like this to make a story come to life. Could I smell the place? Could I could I feel it? It's asking a lot, right? But um, I smell it. <laughs> Look how happy you are with good suggestions. I like it. I know. Uh, so we've got some examples here. Again, these are wonderful. Your ones are fantastic. We could have experiential ones. We could have uh, linguistic ones. Uh, the ones we focused on today are mostly linguistic. I, um, there's a couple here, David, I just want to pick up yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, adding new vocabulary. For example, signposting. Yes, but it's about the where they're using it, perhaps, mm -hmm. as well yeah. as the language. And this reacting and showing interest, back channeling, eye contact. Yes, 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 yes. Because I think we've all had students who we've given a task like this to and they read it. And so even if it was the most beautifully written anecdote in the world, there is no human interaction. So it's not a good anecdote because storytelling involves eye contact. It involves expression, you know, reacting and showing. It's why when you see AI, vid well, when I see AI videos, sort of dubbed in in YouTube, I find it really difficult to engage with them because it's not engaging me. I find they nod too much. Maybe you nod or they nod? They nod, I nod as well. Oh. Um, so amazing ones here. Obviously we didn't want to have too many uh, success criteria today, but definitely um, back channeling, showing interest, uh, do your, your um, your audience enjoys it and everything. These are all fantastic criteria. Um, 
But Mark, we've got an issue with these criteria, right? They're very broad. Is it for everyone? Yeah. So what we, we kind of want here is the students to pick the ones that they really, really want to work on themselves, allowing for this personalized criteria. OK, so maybe for our students, they're like, yeah, I need to, to work on using past simple to tell main actions because at the moment I'm using past simple for everything. So this is where I think it's always really good to return to um, activities and maybe get them to, to use success criteria to upgrade an activity. Um, I'm a big fan of if I'm going to do an activity like this, getting them to record it on their phones at the beginning of the lesson so that we've got a model, perhaps a bad model, that they can refer back to later and upgrade. Um, they might want to say, yeah, OK, for me, grammar is my issue. So these first two are really important for me. And yeah, I've noticed I just say then and then and then. So perhaps upgrading the signpost that I'm using might be key. Um, maybe they're very good at pronunciation and issues around stressing signposts because i think as we we all know when we use a signpost particularly spoken we have to let it breathe there's no point in saying however da -da 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 -da. it's got to be however let it sink slightly shakespearean pause then launch in let the let the listener go oh we're going that way are we right let's go and so each of our learners can base these upon what they feel they need. And obviously we are not totally surrendering control of our classroom because it's still our classroom. And we might be monitoring while they're having the discussion about which of these saying, I think for you, this would be useful. This could be something, remember we had that conversation last week that this is something you could, could do of improving. So <clears throat> looking at, at giving the students a chance to have a look at what they think they might want to improve giving them control over their own kind of learning, not us applying an arbitrary kind of set of rules for them, giving them options. Obviously there could be more than this, but I think particularly the early times you're doing this with your students, give them a relatively narrow group to work within so that they can get the idea. And so that also you can predict issues that may, may happen. We, we've when we talk about this there's often two sort of uh, questions that come at us and um the first one is um how will students sort of know which ones to choose and again it's because at the, if you just throw this at them at the end without having had a thread throughout your your class of course it will be a bit much for them but you've had effective aims and objectives at the beginning of the class and your students have identified their strengths and weaknesses. Their weaknesses are the ones they're going to want to focus on. You know what they're essentially telling you is this is the area I need to learn. This is where I need feedback. And so this is just an extension of that conversation. If anything, it's just the admin side of that conversation. And, and I would like to go back and it's not just that we've discussed the aims and the objectives at the beginning. We're constantly referring back yeah. to them. So we're, we're highlighting which part of the aims we've worked on in the same way that we did where we said, OK, we've looked at these two two aims. We've not seen the last two yet. We're constantly having tiny micro conversations about the students learning with them, just reinforcing points. And, and the other um, sort of thing is won't students just choose the easy ones that are easy for them? And I, I, we hear this a lot. People ask this a lot. They tend not to. Research says they won't. Research says the vast majority of students want to push themselves just beyond their comfort zone. Um, so it, it doesn't tend to be an issue. And the mm. more you do it, uh, the more they get used to it and they know it's going to uh, happen. Um, so it's not it's not an issue we've ever encountered. I'm sure there'll be one student somewhere who does and they just need a nudge. Um, so we've got these beautiful students now who are ready for a task they've identified their success criteria. This is great stuff, it really is. But we've got a massive issue. And we are, we, we just have two ears. Like I'm, you know, in my context, there's only maybe you know, 15 students, but in other contexts, I was chatting to someone the other day with 75 students. How can we expect as teachers to really monitor all of this? The, the answer is we can't. Uh, at any one time, let's say the best scenario, we've got like, 15 to 20 students you're monitoring one group at a time what are you hearing like maybe five met a good day 10 percent of the output that those students are saying in a task we're missing so much but we've laid a framework on our lesson 
starting with aims and objectives and carrying a conversation through to success criteria and into this final task. So we now have students who know what each other is focusing on. We have students who know each other's strengths and weaknesses. We have created mini monitors. And the first time you, you do this, you know, you've got to be careful. You've got to train your learners to, to give feedback. Um, but when you do, when you give them the sort of the, the scaffolding of success criteria, personalized success criteria, you end up with feedback from student student um, that is not, that's, it's objective and it's constructive. Um, if you don't give them this, if you don't give them this support, you end up with content-based feedback. So, oh, I, I really liked your story. I've been to Spain. I really like Spain. Whatever it is, they focus on the content of the story as opposed to what the student was trying to achieve. Um, or I think there's get... another point here as well, which is very often when we set up activities where one student is speaking, the listening student is effectively waiting for their turn. They're not actually actively listening. So no learning is taking part, uh, place from them. If we give them a task to do while they listen, we're increasing their listening practice. We're actually getting them to do something and we're getting them to assess learning. Now, this is vital because we're getting more learning opportunities. Those students who are like, okay, wait, wait till they finish. Yeah, yeah, it was good, move on. The feedback was meaning, meaningless because yeah, yeah, it was good, doesn't help anyone. And I'm, I'm sure we've all been guilty of saying something similar to students, um, but we can probably do better. And so getting students to listen out for specific things gives them a reason to listen gives them a reason to engage because they're, they're forced to think about it and particularly allowing the students to let their partner know exactly what they're looking to work on and what they're hoping to find. We might add a couple of our own success criteria as well, particularly the first time we do this. So I'd like you to work on this, this, and I'd like you uh, to select two things and tell your partner what you want them to listen for specifically. And then we get hopefully much better peer feedback than we might normally get. We get meaningful peer feedback. Yeah, and it's it, like, uh, I was chatting to someone about this the other day and they said they tried it and the first time they tried it, there was, it was, you know, a little bit of dead air at times. And, yeah, students weren't 100% sure. This is what happened. Whenever you bring in any sort of new approach in, in, in the classroom or um, ask students to reflect or really think about what they've done, if it's the first time they've done it, these are new skills, um, you need to ease them in. The success criteria, that sort of provides a lot of the scaffolding. So um, it might feel a little bit uncomfortable the first time, but very soon they will get used to it and it will just become part of day-to-day -day learning uh, as well as teaching. But, when we have these monitors now, right? So we now have students who can reflect on their own success and can give each other feedback. We get um, sort of wonderful conversations like, I don't think I use signposting well because a lot of us are our own worst critics, right? I know I am. It's, <laughs> you are. I am, I really am. Um, but um, so we, we, we creating the mini monitor allows for your uh the, the peer feedback where no no i you did do that i felt i heard that i heard this i wasn't sure about that i didn't quite hear that um so you have the reflection and you have the peer feedback but what is the teacher doing so the teacher's monitoring obviously the the communicative task they're hearing as much as they can and they're making as many notes as they can which is great then there is a peer feedback and reflection session all this does is give the teacher more opportunity to monitor. It helps them to identify uh, areas they might need to monitor in the future because they can listen to the students' conversations. When, where they have feedback to give, they can go around and give personalized feedback to each group. So allowing it to be um, much more focused and personalized as opposed to just, these are general mistakes I heard people making. It's on the board, let's correct them together. It can be much more personalized as they move from group to group further monitoring and giving feedback. And then there's the, the crucial part, which is repetition. So as Mark said, upgrading with an, maybe another success criteria, maybe changing it, um, but repeating the task or more or less the task, maybe with a new partner, maybe with the same one, really depends. 
uh, giving the teacher another opportunity to monitor, this time informed monitoring, because they know the student's not sure they're using signposting well, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna lend an ear here for that one. Um, and repetition is so important. There, there's nothing as frustrating as doing something, not doing it as well as you can, and not getting an opportunity to, to do it again better. There's absolutely nothing. It, it leaves you sort of feeling oh, empty. I could have done it better. I was, um, this is, I, I was doing archery the other day. <laughs> Why wouldn't I be doing archery? Uh, I was in a medieval castle doing archery. That's what I was doing. And um, I did it a few times, did it quite badly. Realized I was kind of using the wrong hand. I should be doing it with the other hand because I'm left-handed. Um, didn't get a chance to do it. Oh, I haven't stopped thinking about that. I really think I could be good at archery, but I did not get the chance. And this is what we do to our students all the time, not with archery, but with English. We give them an activity, they do it, we give them feedback about mistakes, we don't necessarily give them that second chance. Um, so we really feel that that post uh, feedback and reflection uh, stage, after that we need uh, repetition, another chance to do it better and upgrade. So, Mark, what do we end up with? If we, if we do all of this, what do we end up with? Well, hopefully, we, we end up with all of our aims ticked, our objective met, and that should lead us to hopefully engage happy students who know what, what they've been learning. They know why. They, they get the function of it. it. It's not just an activity in class. It's something that has an applicability to their lives because we've made the case for that. We've got students who've been able to personalize their own level of success. And more importantly, perhaps, we've got students who can engage in their, their learning. We know students, we, we're building students who are able to make informed decisions about where they need to put their effort. So it should make all of those tutorials that, that you might have with students much more effective. And I think a lot of this, ties into really a lot of the modern way that we're thinking about education. If you look at things like uh, the CEFR framework and, and the changes that have come in in the last five, 10 years, a lot of it is pointing more in this direction. And I think life in general is pointing more in this direction. If you think about interviews you might have had, interviews nowadays that I, I might have in a work context are markedly different from when I started teaching 20 years ago. Um, so I think we're helping our students understand processes better ultimately and that should lead us to our our kind of holy grail as indiana has found here yes. so that's why we think you should be should be engaging and trying to do this david where can we find out a bit more about this well well we wanted to um, leave a few um a little bit of time for questions so guys if you want to start writing in any questions you have and one in the q a wind you up well let's let let them come in and then we'll, we'll come back to them in uh, in a second so guys feel free to put them in the chat window or in the q a and we'll we'll we've left some time um but just one final sort of point on this uh while you guys are writing questions is we this this sort of if we call it sometimes like a framework just laying it on top of a lesson you know this idea of have effective aims and objectives discuss them throughout have success criteria discuss it throughout um it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, you are maybe more of a grammar teacher or a lexical, lexical approach or uh, whether you're doing test, teach, test or whatever like approach or methodology you're using, this can sort of lay on top of it. Mm. Um, we never want to sort of tell anyone, you know, how to teach or how to get through to their students. They know their students. All we want and all we believe is that students are a valuable resource. They're key stakeholders and they should be involved in that discussion throughout. So whatever you're teaching, however you're teaching it, um, we would urge you to sort of let your let your learners in on the, uh, on the discussion. Um, if you have enjoyed some of the things today, uh, you can check out our lessons on our, our, our blog. Um, there's lots of lessons on in our textbookation book. All of the sort of the ideas and everything we're talking about today are in those materials as well. This is something that we believe should be on the page as much as possible and just sort of encouraging these discussions and if you really want to dig into aims objectives feedback success criteria and all that oodles of ideas inside over at teaching uh, but let's see what questions we have 
Yeah, so we've got the first one came in from Clem, um, who's been quite active during the lesson. So would you always include meta language, signposting, possessive pronouns, past participle in your aims, success criteria? Um, not necessarily, but I do think students understand what we mean, particularly by the grammar points. Um, so I'm in general a fan of using the language that's recognizable to students. Probably the exception where I move away from the language that's known to students is things like signposting, because I want to explain why I'm calling it that. And I, I make the point that I'm that I made to you guys that I'm moving away from the idea of, of linking words to thinking about the function of the language. So in that sense, yes, I would use that. Um, I think it, it, it depends on exactly what my my aim is, but I think I probably do. David, what about you? It really depends on the lesson and the students and everything like that. Um, some language is useful to enable conversations. I tend to try and keep away from it. Well, like my context is continuous enrollment, new students in all the time. So we try not to have like meta language heavy, but um, we will always have things like aims and objectives, success criteria, because that just allows us to have the discussions we want to have. So that uh, becomes part of our sort of student training. I think it really depends what you're trying to achieve. I wouldn't leave it up to kind of you and uh, you to decide with your students. Um, there's a nice one here from Andy. Uh, I love all of this. How do you balance focus on self-assessment of success criteria and focus on content and meaning uh, of task? It, 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 yeah. Um, sometimes we, I do it a few times. So sometimes I say, tell the story and your job is just pure reaction. And then let's go again. And this time I want you listening out for this. And so it really depends on, on the task and what I want to uh, achieve with it. Um, but yeah, hundred percent it's, it's it, sometimes you just want them to have the conversation and for all people to take part naturally as they would. Um, but I do think there's, there's time for talking about success and, and feedback. And um, things, right? Andy did have another question here, which is, I love all of this, but how do you balance focus on self-assessment of success? That's what I was just answering. Right. right. Sorry, I was <laughs> typing in. You're thank you uh, thank you so much uh, mark and david it's been a wonderful uh, session uh, we do not have any, much time left so perhaps if i could ask you both to one sort of final question for today what sort of advice would you give to a teacher who's never approached aims and objectives uh, this way so they are you know they've just learned about it from this session and they want to try it in their classroom uh just like half a minute answer what what, what would you suggest firstly think about what is your ultimate learning objective what are you trying to get the students to do and then think of three or four stages and aims that will help you get there I think I would go with, like you said, I start with the ob objective that every lesson has to begin with the objective and work backwards. I think if you can identify what your real life objective is in your lesson and just start with that one, just open the conversation with that one. Guys, this is our real life objective today. How will it help you in your real lives? Um, and that's sort of baby stepping in your students and yourself. Um, but if you can't think of a real life objective for your lesson, then that sort of opens up a reflection conversation too.